When I was doing work on my dissertation to receive a Doctor of Ministry degree in spirituality, I focused on whether or not discernment can be taught or if it is an inherited or innate skill or gift. My research focused on leading exercises in discernment with various church groups. In order for us to have anything to do together, they had to have an issue or a question they were discerning. Part of my preparation with them was helping them to clarify and articulate the question. So for example, one church was asking how it could be more hospitable to the neighbors in the surrounding community which had become largely Latinx. This was a congregation of mostly older white people. Another church was asking about its purpose going forward and whether or not it was time to close the doors. My research concluded that both things are true. People can be taught how to engage in discernment practices and some people have more natural gifts for discernment than others. What if we were to substitute the word wisdom for discernment and ask those same questions? Can wisdom be taught? Or is wisdom something that is innate or an inherited gift or skill? When I finished with the various church groups with whom I was leading discernment exercises, some of them felt satisfied knowing that they had more clarity and direction for their issue or question, and some of them felt disappointed that clarity had not come instantly. One of the tricky parts for me as the one doing the research and working with them was that it was difficult to measure the level of discernment that happened or didn't happen. Similarly, how do we quantify or measure or even identify wisdom. Who gets to say who is wise or what is wise? We often hear elders say about a young person, that one is wise beyond their years. And that can mean anything from that one is compassionate to that one knows things that are usually known by older people or that one is regulated in a way that is often a sign of years of experience, or that one understands the world as though they were older, or that one sure knows how to stay out of trouble. There are so many different meanings, and in each culture and religion and ethnic and social and professional group, there are different standards for wisdom. In one culture, wisdom might entail an endless patience and ability to listen, while in another culture, wisdom might entail speaking words of truth. When we pray the serenity prayer, we ask God for serenity, courage, and wisdom. What are we really asking for when we pray for wisdom? We're praying for the wisdom to know the difference between the things we can change and the things we cannot change. So are we really asking for discernment? The ability to sort and sift through what is before us? Or is there something deeper to wisdom than discernment? The weird thing about today is that we read a text about what we now call Palm Sunday because we're celebrating Palm Sunday, but we're also completing our sermon series on cultivating serenity in an anxious world. While these two themes seem vastly different, and they are, there is some overlap. We heard earlier in the service that the parade Jesus led with his followers as he entered Jerusalem so long ago was more of a protest parade than anything. 
Jesus and the motley crew of people he had gathered around him were, in essence, speaking truth to power by proclaiming Jesus as the respected leader, which in their language was king. While the followers were shouting loudly, the religious authorities, the Pharisees, were telling Jesus to tell them to be quiet. This is where I want to stop the story and do some noticing. There are no palms in this version of the story. So why did Luke leave out the waving of the palms or the branches? Sometimes they're just called branches. Maybe the writer of Luke decided they would be a distraction because the cloaks being thrown on the ground for the king had historical precedence. Maybe he decided the palms were too political since they reminded everyone of the Hasmonean dynasty which ruled before the Roman Empire came in and wiped them out. We don't know for sure. Despite the fact that there are no palms, the writer of Luke says the crowd was yelling, blessed is the king who comes in the name of God. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. When the Pharisees heard the crowd yelling, they wanted Jesus to silence them. Don't you wonder why the Pharisees were trying to hush the crowd? It's possible they were afraid of reprisal against the Jews, which included them. What if someone from the parade on the other side of town heard this? They could literally be killed for this kind of sedition. It's also possible they were worried that the crowd thought Jesus might be an actual human king and distract them from God. Remember, the Pharisees were the rule followers. They were good people committed to the law of God and ordered. In some ways, I think of them as the Presbyterian version of the Jews, the ones who wanted things done decently and in order. They might be ones on the Enneagram, if you know the Enneagram. They want to be good and they want the people around them to be good, and that requires obedience. So often in these stories, we imagine ourselves as the followers of Jesus. What if, for today, we imagine otherwise? What if we are the protectors of the status quo or the ancient traditions? What if we are the ones asking Jesus to hush the crowd, to silence the praise and worship? If we are, then we would surely hear Jesus' response anew. I tell you, even if these people were silenced, the stones would shout out. Praise for Jesus will ring out no matter who or what you try to silence. If I were going to shout like the crowds or even like the stones, I would want to shout my question, which has never been answered. Why did Jesus go to Jerusalem knowing that he was on the hit list for the Roman Empire? Haven't you wondered the same thing? Why not go elsewhere for a bit and let things cool down? Why ride into the belly of the beast? Was Jesus lacking the wisdom to know the difference between the things he could change and the things he could not change? Or was Jesus just plain lacking in wisdom? Oddly, there have been prophets all through time who have done the same as Jesus did. Instead of walking away from danger, they have walked into it. What's fascinating to me is that most people who have done that have the combination of 
all three attributes in the serenity prayer. They have serenity, they have courage, and they have wisdom, none of which means the absence of fear. But what we don't know is how do they come to understand their mission and purpose and call as a walking into the belly of the beast instead of a walking away from. Not all of us in every situation are called to confrontation. The Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, womanist scholar and preacher and teacher and lifelong Presbyterian and the first black woman to be ordained in the United Presbyterian Church in 1974, told a story a few years ago at the Women in Ministry Conference at Princeton about a course she took in her doctoral program at Union Theological Seminary in New York with a world-renowned older white male scholar who threatened to fail her because she wrote a paper that made him feel. Dr. Cannon knew her paper was academically solid and was a genuine enfleshment of womanist themes. As an African-American female scholar, Cannon says she is consciously present as an embodied person each and every time she is engaged in the complicated task of translating, reading, and analyzing texts. She couldn't figure out why, when womanist perspectives and scholarship were legitimate, this professor dismissed her work with such disdain and dismissal. She asks the question, what made humanizing knowledge so terribly wretched and awfully despicable? What is so wrong with uniting our heads and our hearts? Why is it unsound for us to blend usable wisdom from our heart with rigorous, practical intellect? Dr. Cannon quotes historian Dr. Charles Long, who says, enslaved women and men and children who were branded like cattle and covered in marks and shackled in dungeons of slave castles, and who were crammed into the bottom of poorly ventilated ships, with their faces pressed against the backs of those chained in front of them across the transatlantic journey. We had to learn how to think with our bodies in the midst of devastating terror, power, and brutality. Historian records tell us that the treatment on the slave ships was so harsh and the conditions so horrendous that one out of every eight Africans died during the journey. There are guesstimates that somewhere between six and 60 million Africans are buried in the watery grave of the Atlantic. The professor who was berating Dr. Cannon said, I should be able to read your paper and feel nothing. This notable scholar concluded his tirade by saying her exposition was an abomination because her paper evoked and aroused, aroused too much in the way of combustible feelings. He told her that her paper was so bad he couldn't even flunk it. She laughs when she tells that part of the story and says, that's when you know that's very bad. He said he didn't even want to waste any more of his time by writing the letter F on her paper. Dr. Cannon ends this story by saying, at times like these, she calls on the lessons of faith she learned from her foremothers. Her great-grandmother's parents were among the Africans enslaved in the U.S., counted as non-persons. Her great-grandmother knew that the enslaved and the enslavers could not serve the same God. 
She says, by holding on to God's steady hand, her ancestors knew that despite the preachers and evangelists and Sunday school teachers who told them they were less than human, her ancestors knew that God does not make inferior people. After the Civil War, her great-grandmother walked from plantation to plantation until she found every single one of her children, despite the fact that some of them were stolen from her at such a young age she couldn't recognize them. Imagine not knowing what your children's permanent teeth look like. Kenan says God's amazing grace support supported enslaved Africans against the nastiness of life. Dr. Cannon says she used that same kind of investigative determination that her great-grandmother used in putting her family back together to figure out what made her research paper such an abomination. Was Jesus wise in riding into Jerusalem where he knew those in power would surely arrest and at least imprison him, possibly even murder him? And what would be the wise thing for Dr. Cannon to do with the scholar who had the power to fail her? And what does wisdom look like for us as we consider who and what to confront and who and what to put back together and when we want to join our hearts to our heads and when we get spiteful or argumentative or authoritative because someone made us feel. At the end of the day, who gets to say what's wise and what's foolish? Any time there is a protest or parade, we find ourselves evaluating the wisdom of it. When people all over this country poured into the streets last May after George Floyd was murdered by police on camera for the world to see, there were those who said it was unwise for people to protest because harm would surely come to them. Imagine the decision makers who armed the Chicago police officers as though they were going to war and then cut off all the practical ways for the protesters to leave the downtown area. What or whose wisdom were they employing? Surely not God's wisdom when God claims each person as God's own. The wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong and good and evil is only going to be known when we too become embodied and are willing to risk feeling. When we are willing, in Dr. Cannon's words, to think with our hearts and feel with our heads to think with our heart and feel with our heads. Dr. Cannon went on with the story to say she found the professor's critique of her work ironic. The name of her paper was The Agony in Gethsemane, and the seminar she was in was titled The Passion Narratives. She said that to have written about the agony in Gethsemane in a disembodied way would have felt like an oxymoron and would have put her mind in competition and over against her body and her spiritual self at odds with her intellectual self. She knew she would have to acquiesce to her professor who saw her, a black woman, as inferior and rewrite her paper. She relied on the faith of her mother, who was born in 1919, and for 50 years of her mother's life, a black person was lynched in America every two and a half days. 
She told her mother what was going on, and her mother replied, you know they're hiring at the mill. But then she told Dr. Cannon a parable and said, when you have your head in the lion's mouth, you have to treat the lion very gently. Dr. Cannon reports she rewrote her paper as a disembodied talking head and removed all voices in her paper that were not Eurocentric. Her professor still refused to give the paper a letter grade, but Dr. Cannon passed the course and went on to teach for 45 years. I would argue Dr. Cannon and Jesus both discerned, which meant sorting and sifting through the various good options, the way forward. Dr. Cannon had the wisdom to know she would not change this professor who insisted on upholding white Eurocentric patriarchal scholarship, but that if she passed the course, she could change the whole institution of religious scholarship, and she did. She is credited with founding womanist theology and ethics as a field. Jesus had the wisdom to know he could not change Pilate or the co-opted priests, but he could change the world. And he did. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen.